turn Siri into your own personal Jarvis, the White House gets hacked again, and underwater Google Maps. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 353 for Friday, June 5th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. Take advantage of the fact that your employees already know Dropbox and don't waste time trying to find a different solution. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about tech culture and news with the people writing about it online. In preparation for Apple's big Worldwide Developers Conference that starts Monday, we have invited Jeff Benjamin from iDownloadBlog to talk about all things Apple. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, Megan, how you doing? I am good. So Apple's first HomeKit devices were shipped this week. HomeKit is Apple's Internet of Things framework that helps you control your connected devices at home. You got a chance to try HomeKit Take, you took it for a spin with some smart lighting. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I had the uh, Caseta Wireless Smart Lighting Dimmer Kit. That's a mouthful, I know. But um, uh, this is a device that works with HomeKit. And HomeKit is basically like three pillars in my eyes. Number one, it's controlling connected devices using Siri, so using your voice. Number two, it's controlling accessory accessories away from home uh, when configured with an Apple TV, so the Apple TV works like a hub. And then number three, it's grouping accessories together into homes, into uh, rooms and scenes. So you can control things granularly or you can control them uh, as a group. So you could say, hey, turn off all my basement lights, for instance. Cool. It's so, really cool. So you weren't necessarily really uh, checking on the, you know, testing these lights in particular, but just seeing how HomeKit was working. Uh, and since this was like one of the first devices, and I, I know it, it's been a year since it was announced, um, so, so what are your thoughts about HomeKit itself as, uh, as the future of it? I think it's, it, it's extremely impressive um, because it's just so easy and so accessible to users. Uh, in the past, we had something called X10, which is a home automation protocol, and it was really cumbersome. It was slow. It wasn't encrypted. Um, and it was just it, it was expensive as well to get everything set up. This is just almost plug and play, so it's extremely easy to get set up. So uh, were you able to control your lights with your Apple Watch? No, that is, um, <laughs> that's kind of like my biggest pet peeve with this thus far is that you can't actually say, hey, Siri, on your Apple Watch and then say, turn off my lights because it just doesn't work. Um, it'll tell you to, hey, use handoff on your iPhone and we can, we can do that. But obviously that's, that's not what I want. And that's not what users want either. So hopefully we'll, we'll have Siri or a Hey Siri integration with HomeKit on the Apple Watch soon. Well, have you tried uh, Amazon's Echo at all? I haven't. How is it? Have you? Uh, I have. Yeah, I like it. But, um, you know, there's some things it does that Siri doesn't do and some things Siri does that it doesn't do. I mean, I haven't used it to really control any devices, just, you know, my music or, you know, my calendar, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But it is interesting to just have this device in your house that you can control with your voice. Um, right. So yeah, so these lights retail for two twenty nine ninety five uh, on Amazon. Would would you say those are worth it? Um, you know, I was doing some comparison with the the old school automation protocol and all the stuff you would need to get that started. So I think it is a pretty good starter price, like to get in the game, so to speak. Um, it is expensive, but if you want home home automation, you're going to have to pay a little premium. And now, did I remember when I watched the video that you connected it to your Nest? Also, y yes, I did, um, but I couldn't get the Nest to work with the Siri vo voice control. You actually have to control the Nest from within the app. So I don't think the Nest, at least at this point, has HomeKit compatibility. Right, and that's probably by design. Nest is owned by Google, yeah. right? Exactly. So, yeah. So you had a video uh, on your site also about how to replace Siri sound effects with Jarvis sound effects, as long as we're talking about you know the personal assistant in our home. Um, so uh, how did that work? Um, it was a little rough around the edges. Um, it's sort of a hack. Um, and yeah, like the, the sound effects were like cut out of a movie, I think. So they were just really, really kind of clunky. And uh, but the idea is great. Like I would love to have Morgan Freeman as my Siri voice. That would be awesome. 
<laughs> I know. And that's the other thing with the Amazon Echo, too. Not only can you not really change her voice, you can't change her name, which I found really annoying because I really want to call Alexa Jarvis. And right now you can only <laughs> change it to Amazon, which right. is unfortunate. Uh, yeah. So we're hearing a lot of rumors about uh, WWDC and what we're going to hear. That We hear that we're not going to hear an announcement about Apple TV, but there is a lot of talk about the new Apple Music subscription service announcement. Um, now, you've had a chance to play with Apple Music in the beta of iOS 8.4. Uh, what can you tell us about it? It's really cool. It's actually a complete overhaul of the Music app. It's the biggest change that the Music app has seen uh, since the inception of iOS. Um, it has basically three features that are, I think are really cool. Uh, number one is up next support. So that allows you to cue music Instead of having to stop music when you want to play another song, you can just say, hey, cue this song and play it next, uh, which is awesome. You can do that on the uh, desktop version of iTunes. So that's finally coming to the, um, you know, to the iPhone. And then you have a mini player, which allows you to control playback and access a now playing interface from anywhere within the music app. And that's something, again, that many users have been clamoring for for a long time. And then lastly, there's the rumored streaming service that will come. Uh, rumors are stating that for $10 a month, you'll be able to stream music, sort of like Spotify. It'll come with a three-month trial, and it'll launch near the end of June. So I'm looking forward to that. So this is definitely the biggest upgrade we've seen for the music app. And now, are you a Beats subscriber now? I am not, actually. Um, I do use Spotify. I'm a pretty big Spotify fan, so... Yeah, I, I use them all, and I, I am hoping that uh, Apple Music will be the one to rule them all, the one streaming service, because right now I'm not exactly sure how much I'm paying a month, but it's a lot more than I probably need to be paying. <laughs> right, yeah. and that's the thing, like, with Apple Music, um, the they're automatically out of the gate. They're, they have a huge advantage because they're integrated with iOS. So, like, for instance, you can already imagine how it'll be when you're setting up your iPhone for the first time and you see like the uh, splash screen, and then you're going through setting up your Wi-Fi network, it'll say, hey, we have this great new Apple Music service. Uh, you get three months free. Would you like to sign up? And of course, it's going to be easy to do that. Uh, so I think uh, Spotify and the others have a, a big test ahead of them to see how they can compete with this. Right. The other reason I'm interested in Apple Music is I've had a hard time with my Apple Watch um, trying to control. Like it, for, it seemed like, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, it seemed like there were more controls with the Now Playing um, app on my Apple Watch before the update. I felt like I used to be able to control Pandora and um, you know some of the other podcast apps. And with the update since then, it's now I, I can't control anything any longer with the Now Playing app except for uh, Apple Music or Beats. Yeah, I haven't actually tested it out. I, I rarely use my Apple Watch, actually. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of a fashion accessory at this point. But you have so many tips. I do, I do. So I use it for tips, but an actual like day-to-day -day usage, you know, I've, I was talking to some of the guys at I Download Blog about this, and, um, you know, it, it's just not getting as much use right now. But I think in the future, it's, you know, Apple's going to offer some upgrades. They're going to have... Uh, native third-party apps and things are gonna get a lot better. So, but you don't use it. Do you use a different smartwatch, or are you just not a watch wearer? Um, I actually have. <laughs> I'm gonna be uh, talked about for this, but uh, I do have some Android Wear smartwatches that I use. I have a LG uh, G Watch R, and um, uh, but I do use the Apple Watch. I, I do use it. I, don't, I won't say that, but it's just not as much as I thought right. I would use it. Well, there's some people that love that you just said that because, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> Android users that watch this show and, um, right. you know, are just probably watching their Android watches right now. When is she going to stop talking about Apple? Uh, right. So they're probably very happy to hear about that. Uh, yeah. So so let's talk about the Apple Watch. It's really interesting that you say that you don't really use it. I mean, I use it all the time, but whenever, you know, I we live in a small town here. I don't, you know, I don't hang out with a lot of techies in my regular life. So um, mine is the first Apple Watch that a lot of people see, and and they want to know um, what's so great about it. And sometimes I do have a hard time explaining what's so great about it to non-technical people, um, which is interesting. And also, I also preface that you know I got it for work. I'm not sure that I would have paid for it myself, but. Um, that said, I do love it. <laughs> so uh, you had a gr some great tips about some things you can do with the uh, Siri integration. Tell us about those. Well, um, basically, the way Siri works on the Apple Watch right now is that you say, hey, Siri, send a text message to so-and-so, and then it'll present like two buttons on your, on your watch to say either cancel or accept. 
and you have to physically like tap those those buttons. So it's not totally a hands free experience. But what I found out is that if you continue to say, hey, Siri, and then say yes or whatever the button, the context of the button says, you can use Siri hands free completely without actually having to touch a button to confirm. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of cool. So when I first contacted you last month, because I think you broke the story about how easy it would be to steal and reset an Apple Watch since it doesn't have activation lock. Um, explain a little bit about that story that you wrote. Yeah, this is an interesting thing because I, I didn't expect this to blow up like it did, but unfortunately it did. I didn't mean for people to run with it like it was this devastating flaw and it was just a huge problem. Um, and people painted it like Apple was just horrible for doing this. But remember, activation lock didn't appear on the iPhone into iOS 2, no, iOS 3. No, it was iOS 7, seven you know, generations in before we got some real security. So basically what this means is that someone could take your Apple Watch, they could reset it, perform a factory re reset, and then uh, either resell it or just keep it for themselves. And it would work just as if they bought it right off the shelf. Uh, whereas with activation lock on an iPhone, if someone steals your, your um, iPhone and you have Find My iPhone enabled, they can't activate that phone until that password is entered. So it's basically useless. Right. So it's not an issue of people stealing your personal information uh, necessarily, right. but just actually stealing your watch. Whereas someone is less likely to steal an iPhone now knowing, if they know that you know they can't really use it again. Right, and the Apple Watch is tethered to you all the time. So if someone like takes it off your off your wrist, I think you have bigger problems to worry about. <laughs> right? I mean. Yeah, there were a lot of follow up pieces to your piece. It was interesting. You know, it was like, well, someone could take it off your wrist and hold their fingers on it because, of course, when you take it <laughs> off, you have to enter the you know enter the passcode again. People were like, well, if you hold your fingers, then you know, yes, and like you said, you have much bigger problems if yeah. if that is happening. Now, another piece of news that was announced today was that the Pebble Time iPhone app is live in the App Store after some delays. There were some people arguing that, you know, Apple was holding it up, and but that there was a bug apparently in it. Um, so now some users have received their Pebble Time. I have not gotten mine yet. Have you had a chance to play with the Pebble or the Pebble Time? I had an original Pebble, um, and it was like the first thing, the first eye-opening thing that let me know that wearables were a legitimate product. Like this is something, this is the future. Um, so I do credit Pebble heavily with helping me to realize that. Uh, I haven't tried the Pebble time at all, and uh, I probably won't. But So you haven't gotten yours yet? No, I haven't. They say before June. But, um, you know, and it's funny because I ordered it at a time when I just, like, really wanted the Apple Watch. And I thought, well, that's not coming till April 24th, so I'll order the Pebble now. Um, and I don't think I really read the fine print and thought, well, that wasn't going to come till long after. So it'll be interesting to compare. I'll be interested. So, so what about your Android Wear? Do you like better than the Apple Watch? Um, I don't know. I'm just like, recently I've been getting more into Android in general. Like I love the, um, okay, Google, Google. Mm -hmm. It's, that's awesome. Like, I don't think Siri is at that level. Yet. I know for a fact that Siri isn't at that level. Like, like the amount of voice recognition, the way it can recognize certain terms, like I can pretty much say whatever and it will recognize it. Um, so I th just think that's impressive in and of itself. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it is way better. But then the other thing is I, I think Siri could be that, that much better, but also Apple has this thing about not, you know, they, they don't want to collect that much information. They don't want exactly. you to Exactly. So. Yeah. So it's sort of, I don't know, you just kind of take, take and give. Right. So what are you excited to see next week at WWDC? Uh, well, the rumor mill is stating that we're going to see some, uh, like, iOS's Snow Leopard moment. So I really hope that's true because um, iOS 8 has some stability problems. Like I think my phone probably crashes at least two or three times a week. Um, it just respring's out of the blue. Um, and I would love to see Apple really just sit down and and iron out all the problems. I know Google I.O. just went on. They didn't really announce any like blow your doors off features. So I think it's a good opportunity for Apple, uh, since they don't have to make this huge splash to sort of, you know, punch back. Um, they could take this time to, to build upon what they already have out there with iOS 8. And third-party keyboards, that's my, I just want that to work like normal, like it should. 
You don't, you don't ask a lot. That's all you want. Yeah. Just give me third party keyboards and I'm fine. <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Jeff is a writer and editor at iDownload blog and has an excellent YouTube channel. Uh, we will link to that in our show notes and you can uh, find Jeff on Twitter at F Ben jam. Is there anything else you're working on that you can talk about? Uh, not at the moment. That's just, I'm just staying busy with iDownload blog and, and making good videos. Hopefully they're good. Anyway. Well, and they are. Thank you so much for coming on. All right. Thanks, Megan. Take care. You too. Coming up, a trim down Facebook for the whole world and Google releases its self-driving car record. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox. If you're watching this, I probably don't have to tell you what Dropbox is. We've been using it here at Twit since about forever. We recently upgraded to something even better. It's Dropbox, but Dropbox for business. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that, and you don't have to waste time finding a different solution. It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training, more productivity. There's simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte, and it's very easy to expand. I uh, haven't even gotten close to my terabyte, and I take a lot of screenshots. I upload a lot of video, a lot of documents, and it's really easy to share them uh, with colleagues. And uh, I just am never worried about clogging up my own phone or my own uh, desktop or anything. There's, there's space on my phone left over for all of that. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. Today, Dropbox announced even more security features. It's now even easier to require two-step verification to better protect account access, because, you know, sometimes it takes a little convincing. To integrate Dropbox with your existing systems, even further, we're extending the Dropbox for Business API with new capabilities for shared folders. Give it a try. Sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Late yesterday, the White House announced that the Office of Personnel Management had been hacked, exposing the personal data of over 4 million current and former federal employees. Today, Reuters reports that hackers gained access to security clearance information and background checks dating back to 1985. I don't know if you've ever had to get security clearance for every for anything, but it is a lot of personal information. Experts say the hackers appear to come from China, and they could be the same cyber criminals responsible for the health insurance hacks at Anthem and Primera. This week, Facebook released a lightweight version of their site designed for Android users with slow 2G connections, mostly in emerging markets. The official Facebook app is 30 megabytes, whereas Facebook Lite is only one megabyte. And Facebook says it will include news feeds, status updates, photos, and notifications. I am fine with either Facebook as long as I can still watch those videos of goats in pajamas. New data from the... There they are. I had to wait for it. Goats in pajamas. Never get tired of those. New data from the IDC says Xiaomi is the second most popular purveyor of wearable devices right behind Fitbit. The category of wearables includes fitness trackers and smartwatches, but the IDC report does not take into account the new Apple Watch, which has yet to release numbers. Xiaomi's most popular device is the Mi Band, which costs a measly $15 and has been around only since last August as compared to the Fitbit that was released way back in 2009. In a move towards more transparency for their self-driving car initiative, Google has just released the first monthly accident report. The May report includes all prior fender benders that self-driving cars from Google have been in. And in case you're not interested in reading the entire report yourself as a thrilling way to entertain yourself this Friday evening, the total number of accidents is 12 in the last six years, and none of them were the robot car's fault. I should say that it is not their fault in the way it's not the fault of all the people who stop short so fast that there's no way for you to not rear end them. It's not their fault like that. And with all the time freed up by not having to drive your own cars, why not while away your passenger time with Google Street View underwater? That's right. The next web reports that in honor of World Oceans Day, which is June 8th, Google has released its four-year collaboration with several mar marine <laughs> conservation organizations to bring us Google Maps of the Oceans. And not to harsh or mellow or anything, but Google has also worked with these organizations to create a GPS-located digital record, which can be used as a baseline to monitor the changes over time caused 
by us people and the pollution that we create. So watch, enjoy, and take care of your oceans while we still have them. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. Leave a comment on iTunes. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell strangers sitting next to you on airplanes. And watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. If you want to watch the show in person, you can send an email to tickets at twit.tv. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And yesterday, I flipped the magic switch to accept direct messages from anyone, not just people I follow. Thank you to everyone who has said very nice things in direct messages. Let me know what kind of stories you want to hear. If you have a guest idea, send it to me. I am all ears. And next week, we'll be covering Apple's WWDC conference. But don't worry, Microsoft and Android folk will still have news for you, too. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.